Thank you all for joining us in the District 5 Congressional Debate tonight. A team of North Central students and staff from our Social Studies Department came together to present this debate for students and community members to experience. On our panel of moderators, we are joined by Nate Sanford from the Inlander newspaper and Enri Denman from the Spokesman Review, as well as our student moderator, du Daisy Tudor. <laughs> Along with our moderators, we have Jordan Allen, Alexis Johnson, and Anya Harmon as our timekeepers. <laughs> Up on the stage, we have our candidates, Bernadine Bank, Michael Baumgartner, Jonathan Bingle, Carmela Conroy, Anne-Marie Danimus, Brian Danzel, Renee Holiday, Jacqueline Maycumber, and Matthew Weldy. There is more information about each of the candidates on the information sheet given to you at the door. We require appropriate audience behavior. Please hold your applause until the end of the debate. We thank you again for coming. Now I will pass it on to our moderators to explain the rules of the debate. Thank you. Um, so just a quick overview of the rules tonight. Um, the moderators are going to be asking questions that have been submitted by students um, ahead of the event. And there's going to be a time limit on statements, answers, and rebuttals um, that will be enforced by the moderators of the debate. Student volunteers will be displaying time cards indicating when 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and zero seconds remain. The moderators may interrupt any candidate if the moderator believes the candidate is straying from the subject matter or not answering the question at all. And the candidates may not interrupt one another. It is the moderator's responsibility and discretion to enforce these rules. And a random number generator was used to determine who will be going first tonight, um, and that person is Carmela Conroy. And um, we'll be going, we'll be rotating, um, and it will be changing, uh, the person going first will change each time. Um, and it'll kind of shift over by one. Um, and there will be no uh, candid opening statements. The moderators will pose the first question, and the moderator will address the same question to all of the candidates, and they will all have an opportunity to answer. Each candidate is going to have one minute to respond to each question, and then they will have two 30-second rebuttals that can be used at any time during the debate. Candidates should raise their hand to indicate if they would like to use their rebuttal, and the moder moderator may lead a brief discussion and follow up if needed. If a candidate is named or easily identified, he or she will have an opportunity to have a 15-second rebuttal each time they are named. To use a rebuttal, candidates should just raise their hands and request it. And the moderator and production staff will keep candidates informed of their elapsed time and will enforce the limits. And with that, we will move on to the first question. So Ms. Conroy, you'll be uh, answering this question first, and then we'll uh, move down the line. So because we have a few young people in the audience tonight, we thought it would be best to open with a question about TikTok. Oh, I'm sorry. I can, I can speak up a bit. Okay. We'll be opening with a question about TikTok. Is, is that better? Awesome. Um, so, uh, Ms. Conroy first. Do you support efforts to force a sale of TikTok? If so, how do you balance that with young people's freedom of expression? Yeah, if so, how do you balance that with young people's freedom of expression?
Testing. Oh, yes, I'm on. <laughs> um, well, I certainly agree with Carmela. Um, you know, restricting one channel of communication does not completely shut down free speech. Um, you know, we have this discussion about gun rights as well. Restricting one particular gun that may be more dangerous does not remove completely your Second Amendment rights. Um, with regards to the forced sale of TikTok, um, it's more of a bargaining chip because they will ban it in the United States unless it is sold to uh, a U.S. interest. Um, I understand national security concerns and a lot of that has to do with uh, personal privacy, but if we're going to be banning anything that comes from China, we should be making efforts to uh, take action against China for the fentanyl that they are sending to Mexico. I am far more concerned about young people dying from fentanyl than I am from their privacy via TikTok. That's Thank time. you. Thank you. Yeah, well, <clears throat> Thank you for the question, and thank you, first of all, for the students, for hosting us here tonight, and for you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out. I think this is way cool, and I wish my school would have done something like that when I was a kid. So thank you, first of all. Uh, thank you to the, my opponents for running. It takes a lot of courage, and it takes a lot of putting your family through a lot to just sign up to run. So I wholeheartedly thank everybody for putting your name forward. It's not easy. To answer the question, I guess I would be a more on the side of, of, of forcing that. Um, and I have to just to self-admit here, I am analog in a digital world, and I'm also not a humongous fan of social media. Um, I think it causes uh, fights for no reasons, and people uh, create a lot of hate and discontent, so it's not something that I really engage in a whole lot, other than to talk about Uncle Buck and like John Candy movies. That's honest to God truth. That's the extent of me using social media. But I think the, far, the, the more important part is that we're giving a foreign country, a foreign entity, an upper hand, and that's what I'm against. And I would take it a step further. I don't think that we should allow more Chinese ownership of farmland either. I don't think that we should owe, uh, have more Chinese ownership of a lot of the areas and industries for national security, obvious national security reasons, and I'm, I'm unapologetic in that stance. I'm sure that there's a good reason to have TikTok, the little videos and everything. I don't think it's worth our national security. Yes, everyone, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for hosting this awesome event. It's so great to see uh, the younger generation getting engaged in this uh, venue. This is so awesome. So yeah, I, so far I, I, I agree with just about everybody up here that, uh, well, first of all, I don't agree with uh, limiting free speech at all, and I also don't agree with government stepping in and regulating uh, business because we're a capitalist society uh, you know, based on property rights and freedom to follow the market. You know, this is a free market system. On the other hand, China is our single greatest enemy. They are the ones pushing TikTok, and in fact, a heavily moderated, controlled version of tech TikTok that casts only a subversive uh, uh, outlook towards American kids that are on TikTok. And this is a known fact that China doesn't have this very, very skewed liberal version of TikTok available to their kids and to their whole nation in China. So I'm very much against what China is undermining That's time. the nation uh, with. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, really, I think we've heard a lot about national defense. And unfortunately, it's the next generation that will be affected um, by the release of this information. Uh, it'll be affected by the leaking of our industries overseas that uh, one of the candidates mentioned, and will be affected by the release of data if anything were to ensue with our enemy. Uh, the most important thing is understanding, are you a participant or are you a victim? And we have to decide on TikTok, agriculture, energy, and defense where we get those things. And right now, we're finding that China is holding those rare minerals that offer to protect ourselves and produce defense. Uh, China is affecting our leakage of our industries that we were relying on them. And the most important thing is that you, as the next generation, define your sovereignty as Americans and that you protect yourself. 
because you guys will be the ones that would have to defend this nation, and you guys will have to be the ones to protect us. All right, that's time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. My response to the question is that no, I do not support the ban on TikTok. As an attorney, I am well aware of the standard of heightened scrutiny, which is the level of scrutiny courts must place on constitutional questions that affect fundamental rights, such as the First Amendment. In order for, for a regulation to pass heightened scrutiny, there must be a clear need and no other alternative. Banning a social media platform and affecting First Amendment rights should be limited to situations where there is a clear showing of extreme necessity. Here, that has not been shown, and so the restriction should not and does not meet heightened scrutiny and should not pass, and so the restrictions that it would bring on First Amendment rights should not happen. So I would say no. Thank you. Thank you for everyone joining us tonight. I think this is just a really wonderful uh, event that the students have put together and uh, their engagement in uh, civic activity is just heartwarming. I, if we are concerned about China or any other adversary accessing our data, we should all give up our cell phones and social media. The reality is that much of our data is already being used and abused by companies and marketing services. I would be surprised if China, Russia, North Korea, and others have not already accessed much of this same information. It seems like the attack on TikTok was disingenuous if there are already sketchy backroom deals being made about potential U.S. buyers who appear to have a political agenda. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm Michael Baumgartner, and in my eight years of being a state senator and six years being a treasurer, I've done lots of debates. This is the first one with nine candidates, but it's uh, very neat, and it's fantastic it's here at uh, North Central. Uh, thank you all for being here. I should start by saying there's a very special person in the audience, which is my son, Conrad, who goes here uh, to North Central and uh, is having a great time. Um, you know, to the question, I think TikTok is a neat medium. I mean, it, it promotes creativity. It's an interesting uh, device for kids to express themselves, sometimes adults as well, too. Uh, but the challenge with TikTok isn't the medium or the platform. The challenge is that it's owned by the Chinese government. And the Chinese government right now uh, is uh, setting the stage uh, to potentially be involved in some very serious national security uh, challenges uh, to the United States of America. And so there is a lot of concern that the data that is being collected uh, while you're using uh, TikTok uh, could be used for nefarious purposes uh, in the future. So I think it is a very reasonable measure to say that TikTok can exist, and again, it's a creative, fun medium, but that it should not be owned by a foreign government uh, that has uh, some potentially very uh, troubling uh, plans for America's national security. Um, I, I absolutely would support uh, the forced sale of, of TikTok. Um, and like uh, um, others have said, I think TikTok is, uh, is very fun. There's a lot of expression that can happen there. Uh, businesses can use them uh, to get their message out very cheaply with some creative ideas. Things that can go viral can really help a lot of different people. Uh, it, it, it reduces barriers to uh, getting out to people, and I think that that's really great. Um, but uh, again, the Chinese government is in the middle of the largest influence campaign the world has ever known. That is a serious national security threat to the United States, and not just the United States, but around the world. China does have nefarious intentions with uh, their influence. They are not trying to build up the United States. They are not trying to build up our children. They are not trying to help them become a better version of themselves. They're trying to hurt us. And I actually would go uh, a little bit further. I just don't think that we should force the sale of TikTok. I actually, as the father of three young children, might even support uh, social media restrictions up to a certain age, such as 13 years old, because I've seen how destructive Thank you, that's time. We're moving along to our second question, which is fitting, fittingly about the Second Amendment. How would you address gun violence, including school shootings and other forms of gun violence impacting younger groups, while balancing Americans' Second Amendment rights? Uh, Ms. Ms. Danimus, this is going to you first. Well, as I alluded to before with regards to the sale of TikTok, um, 
you know, your rights are necess not necessarily completely taken from you because one avenue has been restricted. Um, I do believe in the Second Amendment. Um, I have been a victim of violent crime myself, and I feel that my right to protect myself is inherent in my rights as a human being. Um, but what I find interesting is that every time we have uh, the NRA screaming and yelling about taking away gun rights, there has never been any proposal to completely remove them. What we are looking for is a balance. There, we have, our desire is to protect people. Then we need to do that through a balanced safety program that keeps the most violent offenders away from guns and allows people to still protect themselves and Thank maintain their rights. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, uh, I believe in absolutely no restrictions on the Second Amendment whatsoever. Um, but what I do believe in is I believe that we could do more when it came to school security. What I mean by that is in Kettle Falls, Washington, before the end of this calendar year, there's going to be an armed guard in every single building in that school district. We have things here like the border, we have national monuments, we have the Forest Service, and in every one of those agencies we have officers that are armed with a gun. And I think that they ought to be for obvious reasons. But I don't think that those reasons are more important than the most important, which is our kids. So what I would do is sponsor a bill that would call for that to go to local law enforcement like your local sheriff and city uh, police chiefs so that they could finance having armed personnel in each school district across the America, basically. And then I would try to work with our world's and our America's security apparatus experts, the kind that are uh, tasked with having to prov provide secure buildings at uh, the government and so on and so forth, and get them in here and actually design Thank things you, that That's would work. Time. I am very uh, pro Second Amendment. I believe it as it reads, the Second Amendment shall be uninfringed. Uh, there shall be no restrictions placed upon it. The problem with school shootings and what's happening in this nation is a systemic problem. It has nothing to do with the fact that guns are available. In other nations where there's not guns available, they use other weapons. They use other weapons. In Ireland, when I visited Ireland, there was, I didn't go to Limerick because they called it the stab city. They didn't have guns over there. They use whatever they have at their disposal. It has nothing to do with gun availability, but I might add that as a congressman, I would be very much in favor of providing funding uh, throughout the nation for school security. Uh, to have every single school have the funding for a security uh, staff. Thank and you, Ms. Holliday. That's that. time. The Washington State Legislature this year reduced um, the sentencings of gun crimes in school zones. And so what has been happening is you're actually seeing a reduction in uh, implementing the policies that would protect students of those crimes. Uh, number one is we need to actually uh, stick to the crimes on the books and sentence and hold those individuals responsible. Number two, mental health. Uh, the McCleary decision I voted against is a prototypical school model and it only allows point four, point two, depending on your school, funding. Um, I'm an NRA A plus uh, member. I believe that people should have the right to protect themselves and as a woman, I should have that right. And gun, in a crime-ridden area, now you're seeing violent crime increase 76%. I believe we should have the right, but we also have to protect the victims. I've been endorsed by Gun Owners of America for this congressional race, and number one is protecting the victims of those who commit crimes, and then allowing people you, to protect time. themselves. Thank you. As a career domestic violence prosecutor, I've worked shoulder to shoulder with law enforcement for a long time. When it comes to gun violence and gun safety, as with any issue, I'm a firm believer in talk to the people who know. Our law enforcement are the ones on the front lines that deal with situations on a day-to-day -day basis involving gun violence. So I asked them, how do we fix it? And what I learned from my police officer colleagues and friends is that most of the school shootings that we had could have been prevented if we had Im implemented extreme risk protection orders, which are also known as red flag laws, 
and if we had operated with expanded background checks that go beyond criminal arrest history or criminal conviction history and find greater issues such as mental health history to help identify the people who conduct these shootings before the shootings happen. Those are the policies that I would pursue because that's what the people who know have educated me on would be effective to deal with gun violence, especially in our schools. Thank you. Look, I agree with Senator John Tester of Montana on this subject. Our district is much like Montana, largely rural, and we are a pretty independent bunch. I believe in the Second Amendment, and the fact is that gun bans don't work. On the other hand, there are lots of measures that do work, but we have to get away from bumper sticker logic and look at the facts. Waiting periods do work. Tightening loopholes and strengthening background checks work. Gun locks and gun safes work. Harm reduction strategies like moving a gun off property for someone expressing suicidal ideation work. School security measures like locked doors and mental health services within the schools, like Chaz has established at six of our area high schools, seems reasonable and rational. But I do want to mention some really bad ideas, starting with arming teachers. The problem there is target discrimination. How does the English teacher tell the difference between the shooter in camouflage and the SWAT team in camouflage? How do people know the difference between the English teacher protecting Thank you, the that's students? Time. Well, thank you. Well, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and, and I would encourage the students in here at the school to actually read the state constitution, which has even stronger uh, gun uh, rights laws than our, our federal constitution. Uh, the problem with gun control measures is they only target law-abiding citizens, and they don't prohibit criminals uh, from getting uh, firearms, because those are people that are determined uh, to break the law in any event. Uh, I met my wife in Afghanistan uh, in a pretty tough place, and I used to go to bed at night with a rifle and a pistol beside me with the idea that you might have to use it. And you say, well, that's okay, there's Taliban there, it's a little different here. But we've seen in the breakdown in law and order, lawlessness when it comes to national, uh, uh, when there's big weather events, this idea that you should have the right to protect yourself. Um, and uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, securing uh, students in schools, what we need to do is enforce existing laws. The problems with this state is that we've continued to make it easier to be a criminal and tougher uh, to, to be a victim of crime. So we need to start you, with uh, making it tough to be a criminal. Thank you. What specific actions can be taken to address issues with illegal immigration into the United States? 
um, <clears throat> pardon me, we need to finish the border wall and uh, we need to uh, make sure that we have the toughest illegal immigration laws on the books and then uh, actually Mike said earlier we need to enforce the laws that are already on the books when it comes to immigration. I think one of the biggest travesties is to invite folks into the United States of America that can't really make it that are here illegally and then knowingly make those same people have to go face the court system in a land where a lot of times they don't speak the, la the language even. And so I would just say this, if you think our immigration system is too tough, try to move to Canada. Just go right now and see if you can get in, even if you had a profession and you had a pile of dough sitting around, it would be very difficult for you to get to go move into Canada. I think we could be on par with our uh, neighbors to the north, to be honest with you, where you gotta be able to show that you can pay your own way. Most other countries have sane immigration laws. The United States is right now just the exception. We have to look at what the law says. The law says that uh, well, Article 4, Section 4 says that every state is to be protected from invasion. That is a constitutional law. And, and this is what you call an invasion because this is not just happening in the United States of America. As we look around the world, this is happening in every nation. And places like Poland, Hungary, they've absolutely refused any more immigrants. Um, and, and at the point where it's a flood, it's not immigration anymore, it's an invasion. And this has to be seen for what it is. This truly is an invasion. This is not illegal immigration at this point. This is an invasion. And we have specific laws that address that, well, alone, let alone what we've got on the books that require uh, immigrants to follow the process of the law to be here legally. I'm fully that in is time. Thank of you. those laws. The most important thing we can do as a nation is American sovereignty, and that's protect our borders. Um, to, every nation on earth has a protection, and that is to make sure that we're safe in our borders. Um, we need to fix the H-2A program. We have people who have come over, been educated, and want to stay in our nation, um, and they want to go through the program. We have people who are coming here to work that are actually increasing their own economic status by working here, but the problem is, with the border open, we are allowing human trafficking to occur. I had a group come to the Washington State Legislature and tell me that they're trafficking men and women cartels are removing the men from the families, literally selling the women and children in California and forcing the men to work to pay for the cartels. That is happening in the United States of America. Human trafficking should not happen here. We need to stop the cartels. We need to protect women and children that are in this nation and protect all people. And that starts with defining our borders. That is time. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a lot of migrants coming across our border. There is a lot of um, narcotics coming across our border. I recently had a meeting with the acting chief of the Spokane Police Department. We had a great conversation about the levels of uh, methamphetamine and fentanyl coming across our border, making it to, up to our communities and schools here in uh, eastern Washington. Something has to be done. A first step would be to pass the bipartisan border bill that is currently sitting in Congress. It was negotiated by senators from both parties. It was supported by the union representing the Border Patrol. And when you can bring Republicans, Democrats, and the Border Patrol Union on the same page, that's a good starting point. Does it fix everything? No. But it's a good starting point that we could do expediently. Uh, it adds Border Patrol guards. It accelerates the removal process for people who shouldn't be here. And we can use that as a stepping stone to then address additional problems with human trafficking and narcotics. And that's what I would pursue if I'm in Congress. Thank you. We definitely need more immigrant uh, agents that can uh, ad uh, address the all the people coming over the border seeking asylum. Uh, we definitely need more attorneys and judges to deal with that, and we need more border agents. We also need the technology to detect uh, the different um, uh, drugs that are coming across the border. For instance, we could uh, definitely use enhanced intelligence uh, surveillance and reconnaissance tools like aerostats that have advanced cameras, infrared and night vision to detect border crossings and improve drug interdictions. These are more effective and cost-efficient solutions than walls or lining the border with all of our National Guardsmen. 
DACA is a good thing, and the overwhelming majority of Americans support a path to citizen citizenship for children brought to this country and who have lived here almost all their lives. Stop with the rhetoric. This one's a no-brainer. H-2A migratory workers are a huge part of the agricultural um, economy in our district and that across the time. country. Thank you. Well, we have an absolute humanitarian and national security crisis at our southern border. Uh, the drug cartels are now making more money trafficking humans, uh, and fentanyl is spreading through every county in eastern Washington, and there's been uh, over 100 assassinations on the Mexican side of the border of municipal government officials so that these drug cartels can control these networks. It is a big deal. It might be the biggest deal facing America right now. Uh, to, to fix it, we need to finish the wall. We need to implement E-Verify here in the United States, and we need to stop the abuse of the refugee system as people claim asylum. And that doesn't mean we need to turn our back on real refugees. Uh, my wife and I have worked with some folks on our Afghan counter-narcotics team that truly have been threatened by the Taliban. We've helped them come to America. We have a lot of sympathy for people that are truly uh, refugees. But many of these folks coming right now across the border are simply economic migrants uh, abusing uh, the system uh, to come into the United States, and it has to be fixed. That is time, thank you. We have a rebuttal from Mr. Dansel. I, I just laugh at the point that we are blaming Donald Trump for the immigration <laughs> issues. Um, you know, newsflash, Donald Trump was the first one that had the courage to say it, even only eight years after Barack Obama himself was saying some of the very same lines that uh, Donald Trump used. We all know it. We all know what the issue is. We all know that forever and ever, the left wing in this party doesn't want to solve it because they, they thought that they could get more votes that way. That's just as simple as it is. Please no reaction from the audience. Please no reaction from the audience. This is a high school, please be civil. Um, <laughs> First and foremost, Donald Trump managed to reduce legal immigration. He did nothing to reduce uh, undocumented entry. And I do believe that we have appropriate wall that needs to be maintained on occasion. We reinforce that. But when all, more than 75% of people come into the United States on a valid visa and then overstay, that is really where the issue is. And when the GOP cut the immigration budget by 22% last March, that reduced our ability to uh, 
basically keep up on the people that had come into the country legally. Uh, my cousin is Border Patrol. Um, he now does something he can't tell me what he does or he'll have to kill me, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, what we need to do is enforce the current laws. Uh, most of my Republican friends tell me, fine, just have them come legally. Here's the issue, H2A is for farmers, H1B is the genius uh, one that you've heard about, but we don't have one for everyday That's time. Thank you. workers. Thank Emory, you. Emory, can I jump with a rebuttal? Yes, Bob Gunner with a rebuttal. Well, thanks. Uh, you know, I was just at the border, and probably the most distressing thing, this most disappointing thing I saw was there are um, tens of millions of dollars of good fence bought under Donald Trump that are just laying on the ground resting because for political reasons the current administration doesn't want to put it up. And that's just really unfortunate as taxpayers, as unfortunate as Americans, because this shouldn't be a Republican or a Democrat issue. And what the Biden administration is doing instead is just putting them kind of chicken wire stuff because of the campaign promise not to fill in that wall. And we just need to do better than that. It should be an issue where Republicans and Democrats come together across the country. But that was the most distressing thing I saw there. Emory, I'd like to rebut as well. Okay. This wide open border and this invasion that we're experiencing is going to come and bite us very soon. We've seen over 100,000 CCP military dispersed through all 50 states, according to intelligence. It's not a joke, and this, all, the whole border invasion has got to be shut down. We need the wall and we need to export all of these illegal invaders ASAP. Uh, Ms. Anderson, you can rebut that. Thank you. I lived in Mexico for nine years. I'm telling you that the border is not wide open, and to say that disrespects the men and women in uniform who guard our borders and do what they can to protect us. Uh, we have more than just the southern border. We also have to guard our airports. One of the largest failings in this country with regards to security of our borders when we, when we unfortunately allowed terrorists in that took out our towers at 9-11. I do not want open borders. I want a safe and secure country. I want to keep bad actors out like traffickers and, uh, uh, and uh, drug Thank traffickers. That's, but that's we have to Thank let you. people in. This issue shouldn't be political. This is the definition of our nation. And right now, fentanyl is everywhere. It's less than a dollar a pill, and it's gonna kill the next generation if we don't stop it. Number two, Spokane had a human trafficking sting recently at a massage parlor. They're selling women and children here in Spokane. This shouldn't be political. This shouldn't be Republican or Democrat. If you would have told me 10, 20 years ago that human trafficking... That's time. Thank you. And just as a reminder, um, each candidate has two rebuttals they can use um, during this debate. Yep, go for it. Yeah, so when I was down uh, at the border, I got to meet with Border Patrol agents, and one of the most heartbreaking statements I heard from one of the agents was, Jonathan, every day I come to work, I feel like I'm betraying my country. Because instead of repelling people coming into the country, what I have to do is I have Cartels understand that they are flooding people into the country because it takes up 90% of our border patrol's time just processing the cases, and that's when they're running the drugs over. And so until we get a control on the flow of people coming across the border, we will not get a control on the flow of drugs. That's time. Thank you. Is everyone done with their rebuttals? I'd like to use my second rebuttal as well. Good. Go for it. I've already written two bills, two congressional bills, one to stop child trafficking, electronic, ban electronic voting machines and mail-in ballots nationwide to secure the border, and another bill to stop illegal aliens from voting. All of this is focused around the border, and child trafficking is fully supported and facilitated through a wide open border. The bill that I wrote to stop child trafficking actually... That's time. Thank you. Oh. All right, we will move on to our next question, and uh, Ms. Holliday, you will take this one first. Do you believe that Joe Biden was legitimately elected president of the United States in 2020? Also, do you have concerns about widespread voter fraud impacting the outcome of this year's election? I understood the first part, but the second part, it was kind of reverberating. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Do you have concerns about widespread voter fraud impacting the outcome of this year's election? Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh. If that's why I wrote the bill to ban electronic voting machines and mail-in ballots nationwide, we absolutely have had stolen elections ever since the electronic voting machines were introduced into this nation in 2000. In fact, the Democrats covered it the best on CNN. Lou Dobbs covered it extensively, describing that Dominion voting machines were brought here from Venezuela. We were instructed on how to use these fraudulent systems by Venezuelans. Lou Dobbs did an exclusive documentary that covered this thoroughly. Ever since, all of these elections have had election fraud issues. That's exactly why Argentina got rid of all of their electronic voting machines right after their primary. They're extremely problematic, and, and as Ms. soon as they ousted them, Ms. he Holiday. was elected. Um, and, and just to clarify, the, the first part of that question, do you believe Joe Biden was legitimately elected president of the United States in 2020? The, we just get a yes the, or no? That he was the legitimately elected? That he was legitimately, legitimately elected. Most definitely no. Absolutely not. Uh, please, no, please no clapping in the audience, please. We're trying to keep, uh, keep things civil. In 2016, Governor Inslee and many others said the election was stolen. I was appointed immediately following, and I was told repeatedly that the election was stolen by the Russians, that it was unduly influenced, and uh, Donald Trump was not the president. And you know what uh, they did? They said, you need to come out and vote. You need to come out and vote. The election was stolen. Come out and vote. What is interesting is in now, when 2020, when there's concerns about voters, they say, don't vote. It was stolen. So right now you have both sides saying that there's a problem and what should actually happen is we should have voter identification when you vote. You should have an ID when you vote. Everyone should. You should have an address when you vote. So everyone is identified and everyone should have a right to be heard. Everyone should come out and vote. Some of our precincts are voting below 30%. 30%. No, Ms. 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 May Cumber, we're, we're also hoping to get um, just a sort of an answer to the first part of the question as well about um, 2020 and whether or not you believe Joe Biden was legitimately elected president. Well, I think you should ask everybody if they think 2016 was legitimately elected too. Yeah, we're, we're asking about 2020 with this one though. Uh, well, I have grave concerns about 2020. Grave concerns. And when my elected in 2016 tell me that also the president that's, that, that, then was not the concerned. Thank you. Thank you. When it comes to the 2020 election and when it comes to either mail-in voting or voting other than at the precinct polls, it starts and ends for me with the state of Utah. The state of Utah does its elections almost entirely by mail and no one votes at the polls, yet there's never any issues. And we all know which party does really well in those elections in Utah. They seem to have it figured out. When it comes to the 2020 national election, there's a lot of speculation or discussion about whether the election was rigged or whether it was legitimate. Prior to the 2020 election, there was a tremendous amount of media coverage of a supposed blue wave that the polls indicated was going to happen in the congressional elections that never happened. Well, a lot of the same people who believe or who argue that the presidential election was rigged support and applauded that the blue wave didn't happen. But it doesn't work because they're the same ballots. If the election was rigged, the blue wave would have happened, and it didn't, and they're the same ballots. The election was legitimate, and so the answer to the first part of the question is yes. Thank you. Thank you. And before we move on, we're going to have a quick rebuttal from Mrs. Conroy. Thank you, that's time. Please, please, please keep applause to a minimum, guys. We're, try, we're trying to have a quiet, calm, civil environment tonight. Uh, we, we appreciate everyone's cooperation. Um, uh, Ms. Bank, I, um, uh, I had a question. Um, if, if it was directly 
uh, aimed at, at another candidate? Was that the rules that if there was a direct Ms. Holliday, you've used all of your rebuttals. Exactly. But I was asking, in addition, I, I believe the rules said that if it was directed at a specific candidate, then that person could That's respond. That's not how, that's how a rebuttal works. The re a rebuttal res response to something that you said. I was just saying that in addition, the rules, I thought I read that in the rules that if they were did directed. You, did you name Ms. Holliday? Right, if you were named. You are not named, Ms. Holliday. Okay, just checking. All right. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to Ms. Uh, Ms. Bank now. Thank you. To answer the first question, yes, I believe Joe Biden was legally elected. And for the record, I also believe Donald Trump was legally elected in 2016. As far as widespread voter fraud, I have been an elections observer in Spokane County for the last few years, and I highly recommend everybody in the audience to participate in that, to realize that the elections uh, are run in all of these jurisdictions by the finest people with the highest degree of uh, respect for our Constitution, and I did not see any voter fraud in the numerous sessions that I went down and watched uh, at our county elections office. So I do not believe there was voter fraud uh, in either uh, election. Yeah, so I, I believe Joe Biden was legitimately elected, but in an era of extreme confusion and chaos and sense of unfairness, uh, the chaos and confusion because of the scare tactics of the COVID era and the unfairness from the fact that uh, folks in places like Pennsylvania, instead of following the proper legislative process to change voting rules, did it with unelected judges. And if we wanted to rebuild trust in the American electoral system, which we absolutely need to do, both sides would come together and, and do things and give a little bit and say things like, let's vote in person. Uh, you know, in this state, we just had uh, a left-wing judge essentially steal a legislative district uh, from a Latino Republican candidate. And it just builds the sense of unfairness. So if you wanted to rebuild this thing, and trust is so important, then both sides have to come together. It would be great if the Democrats would join Republicans in restoring trust by doing things like returning vote in person here in the state of Washington. That's time. Thank you. Yes, Biden was genuinely elected, as was Trump in 2016. I often find it funny that people who think the president was not elected, uh, ele other elected officials, don't ever question their own balance when they win. Uh, that's always curious to me. Um, Mr. Baumgartner is correct that there has been a lack of trust, and a lot of that has to do with social media, with misdirection. 
Um, but as your next congresswoman, it is my responsibility to uphold the, the laws of this nation. And a lot of people think that a voter ID is the way to go, but they would have to be free because the 24th Amendment establishes no poll tax. And there are a lot of people who are not uh, privileged enough to have a photo ID, but they do still have the right to vote as Americans. Um, I find statistically that that would be unnecessary. Um, one of the things that we can do to increase access to the vote is to pass the John Lewis Voting Act. Thank you. Time, thank you. Mr. Baumgartner, you were mentioned if you'd like to take a rebuttal. Oh, this is a 15 second rebuttal, not returning. Thank you. I'll just agree with Ms. Danimus that I was correct. <laughs> Mr. Dancil. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so here's my take on it. Tonight before I came here, I went to a Maverick filling station and I bought a big gulp Coca-Cola and a Slim Jim and I'm not proud of it. That's probably why I look the way that I do. <laughs> but when I did that, I paid with my debit card and the clerk asked me for my identification. And right on their table, it says, we are going to ask for your identification to prevent fraud. Why wouldn't that apply to voting? I think we must go back to in-person voting the same day with an identification. It makes total sense. So that's number one. The second thing is, um, because of what I just said, I totally believe that the election in 2020 was not legitimate. I just don't believe it. And there's people that can, and people have told me that I'm out of my mind for that, but because of all the fraud in, in mail-in voting, I don't believe it. The Republicans in this state have, a, uh, have protected this too, unfortunately, because the local county auditors have convinced them it's easier. Let's go back to in-person voting. What was wrong with it? We got the results That's the same time. night. Thank I you. loved it. As international condemnation of Israel's tactics in Gaza mounts, are there any situations where you would support conditioning military aid to Israel? Um, Ms. Maycumber, this starts with you. Absolutely. Uh, one of the uh, most important things that we can do is protect our ally, Israel. Uh, October um, was one of the most disturbing acts of terrorism by a terrorist network. And that network killed and murdered women and children and babies. And we need to make sure that we protect our allies. Um, one of the most important things that you can do when we talk about terrorist organizations as they move through, and um, I, I honestly, both my grandfathers served in World War II and witnessing what's occurring and what's being said in our universities, um, even in our own state, is shocking. It's shocking that people are saying things about another nationality, another culture, after World War II, and we're allowing it to happen. We need to make sure we protect our allies, protect Israel, and protect Ms. those Maycumber, people. Ms. that's time. And I apologize, it may not have been easy to hear, but I just want to make sure that it's clear that the question was regarding whether you would support conditioning military aid to Israel under any oh. circumstances. Do you want me to finish it? If you could quickly answer the question, yes. yes. Um, I believe that we need to make sure, we just had the Ukraine package, which did Taiwan, Ukraine, and Israel, um, making sure that that's transparent, but we, we continue aid to Israel. Mr. Dancil. Or, sorry, Mr. Weldy. Thank you. Um, when it comes to Israel, they are one of our closest allies. They're the only democracy in the Middle East region. And it is important that we support our ally, that we support democracy in all parts of the world. However, there is a difference between supporting Israel and our ally and supporting everything that the current government at Israel decides to do. I agree with the former and not as much with the latter. The Netanyahu government's approach to the war has been too indiscriminate and too broad. The carpet bombing that we've seen is similar to what Putin has done in Aleppo and in Ukraine and it's troubling. So it is my opinion that we should condition military aid to Israel on the Netanyahu government using a l less indiscriminate approach to conducting the war that takes more into account civilian harm and casualties and allows for more aid to make it to innocent civilians. I agree there has been an exaggerated response on the part of Israel. 
I agree with Senator Chuck Schumer that the Netanyahu government is no longer tenable. But don't forget, Hamas is a terrorist organization. We need to just move forward with very three important interventions, humanitarian aid, release of hostages, and a ceasefire. I support the two-state solution, and while it may seem far off right now, in the end, there is no other way to resolve this generational conflict. Thank you. Well, everything that the United States does with regard to foreign policy should be first and foremost in the U.S. national interest. And it is in the U.S. national interest to support Israel and root out uh, the Hamas terrorist network, their tunnels, uh, their kidnap chambers, their rape chambers, and where they are being backed by the Iranian uh, terrorist government to launch rocket attacks on innocent civilians. So uh, to answer your question, in, in, as the time of conditions that the Biden administration would put on, no, I do not support those. Um, Americans would not sit by and idly if there were a terrorist organization in Tijuana launching rockets uh, into San Diego. We would demand that that network be rooted out. And it wouldn't just be the best thing for, uh, in that example, for the Americans there, it would also be the best things for the people living in that organization. So the best things for the Palestinians, and we do have care for the Palestinians, is to see this terrorist group removed, because if they aren't, peace-loving Palestinians will never be able to step forward and build that country into what it can be. Rebuttal. I have a, a rebuttal for Mr. Wilde. Thank you. With regard to what would happen if there was a terrorist attack or rocket attack on the United States from Tijuana, yes, that would have to be addressed. But the good men and women of the United States military and their commanders would not carpet bomb and level the entire city of Tijuana in response. I just, I'll respond to that. Yeah. yeah, Israel is not carpet bombing Gaza. That, that's just factually incorrect. Thank you, that's time. Mr. Bingo, thank you, that's time. question of making military aid conditional, all military aid should be conditional. Uh, Israel is our ally. I support Israel as a nation state. I support a two-state solution, but I support Israel the way I support the United States and that I don't always agree with what our country does. We carpet bombed Cambodia and Laos. 
We had issues in Guantanamo Bay with abuse of prisoners, and it is up to us to make sure that we are not only keeping our own noses clean, that where we put our money, that we pay attention to it. We have a lot of people up here that are already making decisions. It is up to Congress to review the aid that goes out, and I would support a review of the aid. Um, we also need to look at the money that we're giving to Qatar and Turkey because they are in turn sending that aid to Hamas, who are terrorists. So a two-state solution I, I support, but I don't thank see you, that happening time. until we have a change of leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that uh, my uh, opinion on this will be that as soon as they stop calling uh, for death from the river to the sea, then I'll reconfigure uh, my support of Israel. Um, we have right now in the United States of America, across college campuses everywhere, people spouting off language that's fitting for Nazi Germany in like 1942. And it's accepted. And the people that are in those universities know better how to put an end to it. That's number one. But then number two, I think that they're the only uh, ally that we have and have had historically forever in the region. And so I think that the other part of it too would be is we are obfuscating our responsibility to the state of Israel if we try to withdraw right now. And I'll quote, I never thought I would do this, but I'm gonna quote Bill Maher <laughs> as a Republican at a congressional debate who said, if Israel never picked up another weapon, they would be wiped off the face of the earth. Thank and if you, Hamas that's time. didn't, there would be no more war. In my six years of college education, um, I had special focus in macro sociology upon the Holocaust and the false science of eugenics. I did intensive study in that area because it's horrific what happened to the Jews. God bless the Jews. I never want to see that garbage happen to the Jews ever again. They have been our long-standing ally and it is extremely unbecoming and uncharacteristic of Americans to turn their back on such a long-standing ally. We absolutely need to back them just like you would back your best friend because as the Bible says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. We stand behind Israel and we need to continue to stand behind Israel and absolutely not conditionally we don't tell some other country how to defend themselves, only how can that we is help time. you. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, one more thing on that. We've seen what happens uh, when the United States withdraws and extremist Islam is able to take over. We saw it with the horrors of the Afghanistan withdrawal. We've seen it in Syria. We've seen it all over the world that when the United States pulls out of uh, tense areas like that, uh, all hell can break loose and often does break loose. It is important that for such a strategic uh, and moral partner in that region, we continue to support them. What specific steps would you take to combat the climate crisis? Mr. Weldy, you may begin. Thank you. With regard to the climate crisis, it's as complex an issue as we can tackle, okay? The first thing we need to do, quite simply, is reduce our dependence on fossil fuels because that's where the majority of the problem comes from. It's easier said than done. But we need to have an alternative. If we're not going to rely on fossil fuels, what are we going to rely on? It need to be a combination of green energy sources that will work, whether it would be nuclear, whether it would be solar, whether it would be wind, whether it be hydroelectric, or a combination thereof. But the replacement of fossil fuels with green energy sources is going to be necessary, and that's the only way we're going to be able to tackle the climate crisis. So that's the approach we're going to have to take. Thank you. We definitely need to transition to green energy. This is not easy to do, and we're going to have to really get uh, all of our ducks in a row to make it happen. In eastern Washington, we are very lucky that we have some wonderful green energy uh, already in place. Hydropower, 
uh, wind turbines, and we also have nuclear energy here. I believe we're going to have to expand nuclear energy in order to meet the goals that we are trying to set out for ourselves and improve uh, the situation with climate change. Uh, I think there are also uh, other measures uh, where we can uh, encourage uh, uh, rebates for people who use less uh, fossil fuels, and I think that we might want to even increase uh, our our uh, solutions um, by using more uh, electric cars. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we need to have a realistic approach that's pragmatic. Uh, what we don't need to have is scaremongering and uh, dramatic uh, false hopes. So uh, we can do things like uh, raise dikes, raise levees, uh, do these sorts of things. What we shouldn't be doing is trying to eliminate the clean sources of energy we have right here, which is first and foremost our hydroelectric dams. Washington State was blessed with these, essentially we now have giant batteries, which are hydroelectric dams that can put water out for base load when we need it. Uh, the problem with uh, wind and solar is, uh, particularly with wind, is that the wind doesn't blow when it's cold or when it's hot. And uh, we can't uh, support our, uh, our state's economy uh, if we uh, eliminate our dams. So the first thing I would do is not make the situation worse and would protect our dams. Yeah, I think it's important when we talk about climate, I think it's important to remember that 13,000 years ago we were in an ice age. Right? Remember the Bering Strait Bridge, how people came uh, over to North America? How much carbon were humans emitting 13,000 years ago? It's, it's not all that high. And while humans are having an impact on it, the, over, uh, uh, the, the overreaching response by, uh, by the federal and state government to try and push green energy onto us, what that's actually doing is that's causing problems for the people that I currently represent. I represent Northeast Spokane, which is the poorest areas of town. Every single one is a distressed census tract. When you have uh, clean energy vehicles, EVs being, uh, uh, being subsidized to the tune of $50,000 per vehicle, and they're still not profitable for our auto manufacturers to sell, what ends up happening it is my people, it is the poorest people in the area that are subsidizing these things. We're actually just taking money from the poor and subsidizing the rich because they can afford it. I think that's a huge problem. Absolutely, we cannot remove the dams. We need to support uh, nuclear energy uh, in the country. There was an act in the time. 50s. Thank you. I would bring that back. Please. Go ahead, Mr. Weldy. Thank you. One of the interesting aspects of the climate discussion is it's not uncommon to hear mentions of what the climate was like in prehistoric times, whether it's 13,000 years ago or before. That always is interesting to me because, in, in my view, the same scientific community that is able to tell us what the climate was like before recorded history are the ones that are telling us that there's a problem now. And we listen to them about what, what it was like then, we should listen to them with what's going on now. Thank you. Even if we disagree on why we're having climate change, we definitely are. NASA and the World Meteorological Organization tell us that the oceans are surging to record-breaking levels of warmth for a second year in a row. Summers become smoke season for here in the West and crops are failing or moving to different times of the year for ripening because of extreme le weather. So three things that we need to do is provide incentives from the federal government to unlock U.S. ingenuity. I don't think we have to say what exactly people or companies ought to do, but we ought to provide them incentives to, to develop more green energy. We need to provide support to farmers. We have to continue to eat no matter what happens to our climate. And so support to farmers so that they can adapt their crops and uh, continue to grow. And then finally, we'll need to, to support vulnerable people, whether it's insulating their homes, um, finding, uh, expanding the urban tree canopy, um, or helping them find uh, other means of transportation. That is time, thank you. Roboto. Go ahead, Dr. Bank. The Biden administration has a $1.2 trillion infrastructure plan on the table. I feel like we need to bring some of that money into our district. Some of that money is going for rail. In fact, a lot of that money is going for rail. Rail is far more environmentally friendly than uh, other modes of transportation, and I think we need to increase that here in our district. The other thing is that we see hydrogen fusion coming online. Just here in the state of Washington, there was a billion dollars. That is time, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, for everyone who is scared to death of massive migration, climate migration is a big thing because what's going to get hottest, fastest first is the equator and everyone's going to come north and that's going to be a disaster. Um, scare tactics, I don't like them, but this is real. And if you need to know, find out that it's real, follow the money because insurance companies are pulling policies and large corporations are insuring their companies against climate uh, instances. Um, you know, when the Russians built Sputnik, we said, I'll see your Sputnik and raise you a Neil Armstrong. There's a reason Les Schwab doesn't sell wagon wheels anymore because we are moving forward. This is a country of pioneers, inventors, small business people. I believe that we can grow this country in a green way, the same way that we have grown this country through every challenge that we have seen, through opportunity, hope, and vision, and I am that candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just say that uh, I think the most important thing is to not inflate uh, the issue that we're talking about, which I think is done by virtually everybody. Um, on the left side of politics. And if you were to believe all the predictions, we were gonna die like in 1995 and then 1997 and 1999, and we're still here, so I, you know, I kind of fail to see that it's the most pressing time. I, I disagree with the premise, frankly, that it's the most dis like pressing thing. But what I would say is, you know what I really think ought to happen? I think kids today ought to experience what it was like to live back in Spokane, Washington. It was like 1985. Get in the back of a pickup truck with a Chevy 454 and go to a lake with a bunch of your friends and see how that is and if you feel like you've ruined the environment while doing it. I don't think you're going to. I think we're not. We don't give ourselves credit for how good of stewards we actually are. That's the biggest problem. We sit up here and we have self-hate and don't think we've ever done anything. I would say we've done incredible things over the last however of years with catalytic converters that and automobiles and on and on. Oh boy, where do I start? I wrote the first book in the United States on the UN's Sustainable Development Agenda 21, now 2150. I documented thoroughly in that book that global warming or climate change, it went from global warming to global cooling to climate change. I think it's just basically the daily change in the weather and this is a construct of the United Nations. It always has been. In fact, I documented 32,000 of the world's leading atmospheric scientists and PhDs all got together and petitioned the American Congress to show them that global warming was a lie, an outright lie. And in fact, they all got that same 32,000 PhDs can you please stay on topic and say specific examples of why you think of how, what would you take to combat the climate crisis? Well, what would I do to combat Bigfoot and unicorns? Uh, geez, um, uh, maybe just carry on like I live my life every day. Time is up. Thank you, Miss Holiday. All right. And it's not a rebuttal to Renee necessarily, but it's just the other part of it too that gets left out and I didn't have enough time is this is at a time when the Democrat Party is calling for the Green New Deal to remove the Snake River dams and to do all those things while also forcing an electric vehicle mandate. So you get rid of the dams and the hydroelectric and force an electric vehicle mandate and the batteries are mined, lithium, go Google how lithium is mined and the batteries that go into electric vehicles, you're gonna see some pretty disgusting things. So I think that we always talk about one side of it like, oh, well, we'll just plug the car in and no power is being used, but I hope we all know better than that. All these policies that we've been mentioning, uh, the poor carry the heaviest burden, whether that's the increase in the heater homes or our gas prices. And uh, there's three things that have been done recently. When we talk about um, California just passed the Hydrogen uh, Power Act, which they're putting natural gas through those pipes to someday produce hydrogen. Um, in my district, in Douglas County, we are now moving to hydrogen power. but. Natural gas was supposed to be used to do the transition to 2040. And this year, the Washington State Legislature passed 1589 to remove natural gas for that baseload. 
Uh, two, we should stop leaking our industries overseas. We don't talk about point source admissions. Right now, we're getting our food from the south, from South America, and we're getting our products from overseas. And if you want to talk about transporting them over back here, where they could be environmentally produced. And number three, we need to, to uh, do the third powerhouse at the Grand Coulee Dams. We could produce 800 to 1,200 megawatts there, which is roughly uh, equivalent to 200,000 acres of wind and power. Thank we you, have time. clean energy here. I believe we only have time for one more question. Uh, any candidate that has not used up their rebuttals, I encourage you to use them now. Oh, go ahead. Um, I sit on the Environment and Climate Caucus for the Washington State Democrats. I'm a board member. And, um, you know, this is not a uh, scare tactic versus yee-haw. What this is, is a slow, uh, patient, educated move forward to transition us away from fossil fuels, which have been proven to have devastating consequences on the climate. Um, you know, we need to increase efficiency, increase research and development, and that's Make time. sure that we are maintaining. That's time. Thank you. Thank you. And unfortunately, more broadly, that's the time we have for the rest of the debate. We do have four more rebuttals. If anybody wants to use them right now, no. Yeah. No. I'll yes. Heck yeah. Ms. Bank. Yes. So yeah, I think pretty much uh, anybody with a science background will look at the data and realize that global warming is a real thing. And it's hard to dispute it if you really look at it from a scientific perspective. The tragedy is that we are pushing this onto our children. We are, we are the ones who have created a lot of the problem, and we're asking our children to bear the burden for the future. And I think we need to really be thinking about that as we move forward and what kind of solutions we're going to come up with. Yes, I would love to see hydrogen, hydrogen fusion come on. Thank you. It, you do still have a rebuttal left if you'd like to use one. Yeah, I think the most important thing when we talk about innovation and products, that we're not burdening, burdening the most vulnerable, the people that have to pay to heat their homes, the elderly, the fixed income, making sure you can get to work and you can pay for your gas. We need to make sure that those are the people that we're protecting, that we're not shouldering that on them. And, and that's what's happening when you increase gas prices, when you increase the energy programs. You have to protect people, people living in their homes. And that money right now for CCA is billions, and it's sitting in the governor's budget and it should be used for people to make sure they can protect themselves would anybody else like to use a rebuttal mr baumgartner ms conroy sure. okay. all right ms conroy oh, do i have a rebuttal mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll just say go wolf pack <laughs> <laughs> all right ms conroy Yep. The, the Biden administration, along with the states of Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, recently announced that there'd be a billion-dollar investment in Lower Snake River dams to try to make sure that those um, stay in operation. It's gonna, some of those dams are over 100 years old. In order for them to maintain any of their functionality, it's going to take a lot of investment, and it is a false framing to say it's fish or farmers. We can have both. Thank you. And now, Atasha Velarde for our closing statement. Thank you for joining us here at North Central High School for the District 5 Congressional Primary Debate. We extend our gratitude to the Spokesman Review, the Inlander, Spokane Public Radio, and Northwest Passages for their time and efforts into making this debate possible. A special thanks to Emery Dinman, Nate Sanford, and Daisy Tudor for their excellent work as moderators. Lastly, Atasha, I, I apologize. I, I think that we got this out of sequence. We do actually have closing statements first. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have 45 second uh, closing statements from all of the candidates. There was a rumber, random number generator as well for this. We will be starting with Mr. Dancil. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate you coming here. It's hard to be able to convey in 45 seconds a whole lot, but I would just say I'm proud to be the sole endorsed candidate from the Washington State Republican Party. 
I think that my background in local government at the United States Department of Agriculture and as a state senator would uh, give me the skill set to go in and, and be able to go to work for you on day one. If you have any other questions, like I said, 45 seconds is tough to get that out in. I'd be more than happy to sit here and answer any questions you might have about my positions. Thank you so much. Thank you to all, all the people that are running. And thank you especially to the folks moderating and the kids putting this on. I think it's way awesome. I was at one time an ASB president, and I have to tell you the most that I did was like run the soda pop machine. So pretty impressive. Thank you. Ms. Holliday. I would encourage everyone to uh, visit my website at ReneeHollidayForCongress.com if you have any questions. I have both my books for sale that have addressed Agenda 21 issues across the nation. Uh, I also have written a book to solve the current problem that we're having with this communist takeover. I've written two congressional bills already to stop election fraud and stop child trafficking, seal the border, and to stop illegal immigrants or illegal invaders from voting and uh, uh, I'm a MAGA Republican and I'm just looking for your vote. Ms. Maycumber. Jacqueline Maycumber. I am currently a state representative and um, I'm a workhorse not a show horse and I think elected officials need to work for you. I've passed policies in the house uh, creating insulin to $100 a month before the federal government. Uh, I created the Veteran Service Officer Program to make sure that our veterans get the money that was earned and due to them. And just in less than a year in three counties, uh, veterans got over a million dollars, actually changing some of the uh, poverty levels of veterans. And then making sure uh, kids have hope when they graduate high school, that uh, they have a skill set. And I passed the Apprenticeships in High School Bill. Um, it's really important that as we look Ms. towards Maycomber, the future. That's time. Mr. Weldy. Thank you, everybody. Somewhere in our great district, someone just bought and moved into their new house and accomplished a dream that they worked long and hard for. Somewhere else in our great district, someone just got a new job, the first job in a new career that they studied and worked hard to obtain. Somewhere in our great district, someone is celebrating a milestone in their recovery, whether it's 30 days sober or six months sober. When a person, a, completes a difficult climb and makes it to the top of the mountain, we should celebrate. When a person completes a difficult climb and makes it out of the hole they were in and has both feet on the ground, we should celebrate just as hard. When I see domestic violence victims and survivors pull that off, it's inspiring. As a domestic violence prosecutor, prosecutor, I appreciate it. And so I run on the politics of optimism and the politics of what's possible. Mr. Weldy, that's time. Thank you. I am Ms. running Bates. on women's health and veterans' rights. My message is resonating across the country, and I have donors in all 50 states. As an obstetrician gynecologist, I've seen firsthand how women's health is under attack. This is my top issue because women's health is family health. I founded the gynecology department at the Spokane VA, and I care deeply about veterans getting the care that they were promised and they deserve. I will listen to you just as I do with my patients. Whether meeting with wheat farmers in Dayton, veterans in Chewila, or families with loved ones in Ukraine, I will be a tireless advocate for all. I'm Dr. Bernadine Bank, and I'm running for Congress. I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Baumgartner. Well, thank you for everybody for coming out here tonight. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people on God's green earth, and uh, very few of us uh, get to live in a republic, so we should never forget that. And to all the students that are out here, uh, please be involved in our democracy. If you'd ever like to be involved in a campaign, uh, we'd love to have you as a volunteer, and we write great letters of recommendation. Uh, if you ever see Conrad in the hallway, he has lots of gummy worms in his backpack. You should stop and help yourself to a few. And uh, just please get involved in politics. You know, I know we're going to have at least one congressional candidate up here on stage, but I'll bet you there's another future uh, member, uh, congressperson from the 5th Congressional District out there in the audience and one of you students. So thank you for being here tonight. Mr. Bingle. Yeah, thank you everybody so much for being here tonight. Thank you to our moderators. You guys did a fantastic job. Um, I'm hoping, uh, or not hoping, I know that the, the future of this country is bright because again, when I look up on stage here, uh, I'm impressed by many and I think that there is, uh, we're going to have a great representative in Congress and I'm thankful for everybody here who is running. Uh, we all have families. It's, it's difficult on all of us and I respect every single one of you for being in this race. Uh, thank God for you. Uh, I, wish, I wish success to all of you. I hope that uh, 
that we all can find a way to work together because only one of us will actually uh, win this race. But uh, we all have a role to play in Eastern Washington. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. I hope you had a good time. Ms. Conroy. Thank you. My name's Carmela Conroy, and I would like to be your next Congresswoman. I was born and raised in Spokane. It's the third generation of my family to be here in the Inland Northwest. I'm a third generation union member, and I've got almost 30 years of public service experience as a deputy prosecutor here in Spokane County, and then almost 25 years as a foreign service officer. In Congress, I will work to restore the individual freedoms that were reversed under the Dobbs decision, overturning Roe versus Wade, and the entire string of decisions that, that came before it. Um, I'll also work to um, support working class people. Our tax system has gotten upside down, so the working people are supporting the extremely wealthy as well as the very poor, and we need to turn that back around. Um, and Thank finally, you, thanks. Ms. Danvis. Hello, and thank you so much uh, for having us here and for attending. Um, I am Anne-Marie Danimus. I own a marketing and business development firm. Um, small businesses are the backbone of this nation. So when I help a business, I'm helping to build the American dream. Uh, my vision of uh, this country is a vision of prosperity for all Americans, bringing opportunity back and leaving no one behind. Um, anyone who is talking about the economy in terms of four years or eight years doesn't really know what's going on because this is an issue that has been developing for 40 years. Uh, my vision begins with uh, affordable health care, green jobs Thank you, through climate time. change. Thank you. Natasha, I apologize. Can you please continue? <laughs> Thank you for joining us here at North Central High School for the District 5 Congressional Primary Debate. We extend our gratitude to the Spokesman Review, The Inlander, Spokane Public Radio, and Northwest Passages for their time and efforts in making this debate possible. A special thanks to Emery Dinman, Nate Sanford, and Daisy Tudor for their excellent work as moderators. Lastly, we would like to acknowledge our NC Civics engagement team, teachers and student leaders for initiating this event and working diligently to ensure its success. This would not have been possible without their dedication. As a reminder, please drop off your ballots as you leave and remember to vote on the in the primary election on August 6th. Follow North Central High School on social media for upcoming information on the general election debate we plan to host here in the fall. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Have a great night and drive safe.